morning, branches, friends, family. Um, good to be here with you this morning. My name is John Eshelman, and I get to share a couple thoughts on what it looks like to love God and love people. And I've been, I've been thinking through this. I've been watching the online services and thinking through what would I want to share. Is over the last several weeks, uh, Boogie has been talking about. Uh, evangelism or being a witness or an ambassador for Christ, um, an ambassador of reconciliation about making disciples. And so I want to share a few of my thoughts on this subject and also uh, pay attention to and talk about what's happening in our world and how those two are going to maybe go together. So the first thought I want to share is and, and we'll get into the scripture as well on this, but is about presence and principles. And what I mean by that is there's a difference between being with someone and knowing what someone has told you. And so how do I, I'll, I'll try and give you an example of what I might mean by that. Uh, so I have three daughters, as some of you know, and what I could do for my daughters is write on a post-it note or a piece of paper, I love you and I'll always be here to protect you. Something like that, let's say. And I post it in their room and maybe I even put a tiny little light over it so that they can see it in the dark at night or something like that. Uh, and they have my words. I wrote them. They may even saw me write those words. I love you and I'll always protect you something like that. And so I write that and I put it next to their bed. So, Hey, if you wake up in the middle of the night and you're scared or something's happening, you can just look over and see those words and know that I love you and that I'll always protect you. Now I'll just say that that is not going to work as well as me showing up in the room to hold them to be with them, to be fully present in that moment. Uh, though the note is comforting and the note can be helpful and the note can uh, maybe calm them down, perhaps, what really ends up calming them down the most is me being with them. It's just presence. It's not even me explaining how maybe if there's, let's say there's large cracks of thunder and lightning, it's not even me explaining scientifically about how the negative and positive ions in the air produce such weather that causes these sorts of phenomenons. It's just me being with them. It's a, it's a presence thing. So I want, I, I want, as we, as we just kind of hold that idea, that thought presence and principles, uh, let's look at where we're at in society right now or in our culture or in America at least. And then think about what are we clinging to at this point? And is that helping us? And so here's my thought right now. We're living in a pretty divided time. Uh, you know, I'm sure you've already heard several sermons or talks or newscasts or podcasts about how there's a pandemic that these things like masking up, getting vaccinated, quarantining, social distancing, all these sorts of things um, are causing us to be divided. Some people are for masking up and they have science to back it up. And some people are saying masks don't help and they have science to back it up. And some people are for the quarantine and some people are not. And saying that that's hurting us more and the social distancing is helping save lives and the social distancing is ruining people's lives and sending them into depression. There's different arguments on both sides. It's now become these, these different issues are now right there with abortion and gun control and the death penalty. And now we have masking or no masking. And now we have quarantining or not quarantining, social distancing, not social distancing, vaccinating, not vaccinating. And there's arguments on both sides and it's dividing us further, further and further. Um, and then you can throw in there a few other just, uh, racial inequality, 
CRT, the critical race theory, and that. Uh, you can t throw in gender and sexual identity and uh, education and all of what's happening in that and further and further divided and people have their viewpoints and their opinions and what they believe what they hold to be true based on how they either grew up the values that they learned from their family from how they interpret passages of scripture and we end up feeling kind of divided uh we believe that we have the truth about what's right and what we should do and what everybody else should do. And what I'm seeing, unfortunately, is people being really rude. <laughs> They're insulting people. Uh, and, and I'll just say particularly on social media. I'm getting a lot of people's opinions on social media. So if you stay off social media, you're probably not experiencing a lot of this, which is good for you. Because uh, I find that most people don't speak the same way in real life as they do on social media. They don't, you know, walk around showing you a video of somebody that they disagree with and then writing that that person is ridiculous and this is false and these are, you know, or they just flat out insult and use terrible name calling and words to, uh, to these people. Uh, and I would doubt that a lot of these people, and I'm just, I'm not even talking about, uh, folks that are, you know, maybe have no uh, intention of following Jesus. I'm talking about people that are really trying to follow Jesus and are still really opinionated and just downright mean. Uh, and it's just discouraging. Jesus leaves this one marker. He says, by this, the whole world will know that you're my disciples. And it's by the way that you love each other. It's just the way, I mean, that's just your close friend circle, brothers and sisters, but we're being divided brother against sister right now, parent against child on these issues. And he's saying, hey, the, the way the whole world's going to know, oh, they're with Jesus is how they just, they love each other. And I'm just not finding that. I'm finding these people that are meant to be, and I'll include myself, about love. And we're, we're about what we believe is right. So again, we're about the principle, I would say, as we go back to our principle and presence, we're about the principle far more than we're about the presence right now. Uh, and, and we'll keep walking that idea out. Uh, Jesus has a couple things that he says, and you can look these up in the scripture, but he says these things like, I am the way and I am the truth and I am the life. He says that. So the truth is, according to Jesus, a person. He has another thing he says that's pretty interesting. He says to Pilate when he's on trial, he says, uh, for this reason I was born and for this reason I came into the world, to bear witness to the truth. Okay, so he is actually, not only is he the truth, he is also bearing witness to the truth. He represents it. Okay. He is a representative of the truth. And then he says, everyone who is on the side of truth listens to my voice. Okay. So those are, those are a couple things I want us to keep in mind about like the principles, the, the, the idea, this idea of truth and this thing that I'm interpreting in the scriptures to be actually a relational dynamic, that the truth is a, is a relationship. It's a person that you could put your confidence and trust in rather than a principle that you've extrapolated out and then want to legislate across everybody else uh, and the whole world. So there's a, there's a, there's a part in the scripture where Jesus has this verse. It's, it's in John chapter five. And he says uh, in verse 39, he says, you study the scriptures diligently because you think that in them, in the scriptures, you have eternal life. He says, these are the very scriptures that just, they testify about me, yet you refuse to come to me to have life. And so what I'm finding in people now is, well, we're just clinging to the promises of God. We're clinging to, the, to God's promises. 
And it would be similar to my daughter clinging to the note uh, rather than me once I come in the room. It, it's like, well, I'm just clinging to this, this note where my dad said that he loves me and he'll always protect me. Well, yeah, I'm right here. Like, you could also cling to me. Uh, it's not that the promise is wrong or bad, uh, but one is alive and one isn't, right? Like, the, the scripture is meant to testify to the thing, the real thing, to Jesus. But we keep holding on to the scripture, to the, to, and, and I would say our interpretation of the scripture, right? Because there's several different interpretations. Otherwise, we wouldn't have 38,000 different denominations of Christianity in the world. You would just have one. Uh, you would have the body of Christ, which is how I think Jesus sees it. But leaving that aside, if we're going to be people of love in this world, uh, could we, is it possible that we could defer to Jesus on truth matters and retain our assignment to love? Uh, when, when Jesus talks about truth and even when it's truth is talked about in the scripture, it's not something that we are asked to defend or fight for. And you'll just notice that Jesus doesn't do either of those things either. He lays down his life, even though he is the truth. He lays it down and sacrifices the truth. For what? For love. He gives his life away for the life of others. And what, what I think we, we have over time misunderstood is that the truth is the most important thing right? That is the most important thing. And as long as I'm giving you the truth, I'm loving you. And I would just argue that that's not, that might not be entirely accurate or at least ponder it and think about it. Jesus could have given the truth to all, to all the people. He could have explained everything, how the whole thing works. He could have proved it. He could have done all these things. Uh, but instead he chose to love. And so he laid his life down on his own accord. So now love's a tricky one because we can't define it. Uh, we can only describe it. And so I want to read one person's description of love, which I think is beautifully written. It's uh, very poetic and it comes from the scripture. It's from 1 Corinthians. You've heard it in weddings and other places. And it would do us some good to read it real quick. And then, uh, yeah, we'll wrap this up. So first Corinthians chapter 13, verse one, Paul writes this thing actually in verse 12 or, uh, in chapter 12, when he's talking about various gifts that we might receive as followers of Jesus, he says, I'll show you the most excellent way now. And when he does, when he says that he then launches into this beautiful poem about love. And he says this, if I speak in tongues of men or of angels, uh, which I have friends that do both, right? That are, that are speaking in tongues of men and of angels, uh, but do not have love, then I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. So uh, it's just noise. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries, which I would argue we would be pretty happy about. Uh, if I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, man, apparently this is possible. And if I have faith that can move mountains, wow, but do not have love, I am nothing. So apparently, according to this author, it's possible to do all these things. And actually, according to Jesus, it's possible to do some really great things, even to do it in his name and still not know Jesus. Because it's at, at one point, Jesus has this refrain where he says, on, on, there's a day coming, and on that day, many will say to me, didn't we cast out demons in your name, Jesus? Didn't we prophesy, speak the truth to power, foretell the future? In your name, Jesus. Didn't we do all these, perform any signs and wonders in your name, Jesus? 
And he says, I'll say to them, depart from me, you workers of iniquity. I never knew you. So let's keep on our love passage. If I give all I possess to the poor whew, and give over my body to hardship that I may boast, but don't have love, I gain nothing. And then he goes into this beautiful, uh, you know, it's just four verses here. And, it, and the whole chapter is beautiful. But I'm just going to read these four. But love, as he begins to describe it, it's patient. Are you patient? It's kind. Are you kind? Like as we're following Jesus, we get to ask these things about ourselves. It doesn't envy. Okay. It doesn't boast. Okay. It's not proud. Uh, it does not dishonor others. I want you just to think about if some of you are on social media, which I'm assuming at least one or two of you are, and you're scrolling through and you're seeing the political posts or the advertisements, are we dishonoring other people? Are other people being dishonored? Because uh, I'm seeing other people being dishonored. Oh, love, by the way, way it's not self-seeking. It does not insist on its own way. Think about that. Did Jesus insist on his own way? Did Jesus insist on his own way? It's not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It doesn't delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It doesn't fight for the truth. It doesn't defend the truth. It doesn't insist on the truth. It simply rejoices with the truth. And it always protects. It always trusts. It always hopes and always perseveres. And I would argue that all those always ones are relational dynamics. Those are relational protecting, trusting, hoping, persevering. Those are all relational terms that we could use to talk about Jesus. Jesus protects. We can trust him. We can hope in him. He perseveres. There's all these sorts of things. So what if, as we go forward, we chose not to be right, but to be loving? Uh, it doesn't mean that we're not, we don't rejoice in the truth. It doesn't mean we don't believe that there is truth to be held or to be known. Uh, but in the way of Jesus, it's a laying down of our lives. It's, it's a giving away to choose to love first. And I'm just saying, man, if I encounter, if, if you encountered people like that, that were like that, not only with each other, but were with like, were like that with their enemies and with strangers, uh, I think that would be compelling. It would be compelling to me. Uh, you just don't encounter a lot of people that don't insist on their own way, that don't insist that they're right, that aren't insulting the other side or the other idea. There's just not a lot of people doing that. So as you go forward, as, as, as you uh, reflect on this time, maybe think about, am I clinging to my principles and what I've extrapolated out of my religion or out of the Bible or am I clinging to the one? And can I trust the one who is truth, who is life, who is the way, who is love? And, and can I simply be at peace because I don't, I don't have to be right, right? I don't have to, it doesn't have to be my way. And, and I'll end with this. It comes from Psalm uh, 23. It goes back to this presence idea. Because we're in some dark times, right? And, and we're in some difficult times. And the writer of the psalm in 23 has this, this little part of the poem where he says this. Uh, Even though I walk through the darkest valley, uh, which some of us feel like we're in a pretty dark valley. He says this, I will fear no evil. And, and then he, he begins to describe why he, will fear, why he fears no evil. And let me just offer some ideas about perhaps why we don't fear. Because uh, I think I'm seeing a lot of people being ruled by fear, moving to different states and doing all kinds of things because of fear. Uh, 
But even though I walk through the valley of the through the darkest valley, or the valley in some other translations of the shadow of death, it says, I will fear no evil. And here's what I would say, some of the reasons why maybe we would finish this verse. Four, you know why I'm not afraid? Because I've been training for this for years. And I've got my education and uh, I'm ready. I'm fit and I'm ready. I can get through this. Uh, oh, you know why I'm not afraid of evil? Because I know that I've, I've, I have a contingency plan and I can get off grid. And I bought Bitcoin when it was really cheap. And I've got all this money stockpiled and saved up. Um, so I'm not worried. Uh, I can cover all my expenses. Uh, I've got, you know, a bomb shelter or whatever enough to live for a year underground. <laughs> I don't know. Or I know the way out. Or I've been here before and I can figure it out. Um, those are none of the reasons that the writer gives. But I'd say those are some of the reasons and the ways in which we try to order our lives so that we're not afraid. But again, what the writer says, I will fear no evil for you are with me. Um, it doesn't say I, I'm not afraid because I believe all the right things or I know all the right things. It's simply a matter of presence. So it says you are with me, your rod and your staff. These are, these are shepherding terms. They comfort me. So when you think about where you're at right now and how you're feeling, if you're feeling divided, if you're feeling afraid, if you're feeling, um, angry, where, where is the presence of Jesus at this point? And is it enough? Could that be enough? Uh, what is, what is, what is he asking of you at this point other than to stay with him? Uh, Boog preached on this like just a week or two ago, uh, where one of Jesus's friends, Mary is sitting at his feet. And, his, and her sister's angry because she's not helping prepare for all the guests. And Jesus says, has this great line, few things are required. Indeed, only one thing is necessary. And Mary has chosen it and it won't be taken from her. Uh, just stay with Jesus. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to him, it says in the scripture. Uh, so you can just go with that kind of confidence. So... God bless you guys. I hope uh, you experience his presence in a real way that brings you comfort. And uh, yeah, look forward to seeing you soon. Grace and peace.